Welcome back to the Business Immigration Benchmark. I'm your host, Laura Blanairs. Thanks for tuning in. In this episode, I will be inviting my colleague and Denver partner, Carrie Kowski, to join. And we'll be getting into a state of the U.S. corporate immigration industry, so to speak. For the last couple of weeks, we've been compiling and analyzing the 2023 government data dump, and we'll be sharing our thoughts on that data. But before Carrie comes on, I did want to share some of my thoughts about internship programs. We are approaching internship season, and I've been getting a lot of comments, questions, requests to support HR, global mobility professionals to start, operate, and sustain internship programs for not only their company, but also servicing foreign national employees. So with that, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. As you know, the Business Immigration Benchmark is on Spotify. So if you haven't already, please subscribe or follow WR Immigration on YouTube so you can be sure to catch our episodes, which are released every Monday. The best way to get a hold of me with any comments about this podcast, please DM me on LinkedIn. You can also email my producer. His email is in the show notes if you've got any feedback you want to connect with him on. Okay, let's dive in. Internship programs. Like I said, we're approaching internship season, usually kicking off when semesters end in May, June at the earliest. You know, for varying reasons, companies, organizations are going to be leveraging internship programs for their overall talent acquisition and talent management strategies. So often these internship programs are sitting in that talent acquisition strategy. Many reasons. I know the legal industry has internships, typically 2L years. I know consulting industry, often those companies have very strong internship programs. So without speculating on the reasons why companies do internship programs or not, often HR and global mobility might be tasked with supporting these programs. And, you know, in large intern programs, especially in certain industries or degree programs, inevitably these internship programs are going to be supporting foreign national interns. A stat here I pulled, more than 70% of full-time graduate students in electrical engineering and computer information sciences programs in the U.S. are international students. So if your intern program requires these types of graduates for whatever company you're supporting, you're going to be bumping into a lot of international students. Among doctorate workers or holders, rather, PhDs in the U.S. performing research and development as a major activity 83% in computer and information sciences and 80% in electrical and computer engineering are foreign born. This is all according to the National Foundation for American Policy Analysis from December 2023. And we'll drop a link in the show notes. But that's all to say that, you know, some specific degree programs, certainly in R&D, you're going to be supporting foreign national workers. You're going to be supporting foreign national interns. Past and present clients I've worked with have varying internship program sizes and scope. And I think I can really bucket them into three main categories. The first is established intern program at a small to large company, but not the megas. And we'll talk more megas when Carrie hops on the pod later. But these are companies that strongly leverage their college and university hiring pools. Often these companies are using these internship programs from preferred or partner college universities for like direct feeder programs. So they really want to hire new grads. They use the internship program as an opportunity to understand the candidate. They're obviously a highly performing, highly sought after, talented student from these programs. And they get to vet them for the summer, make sure they're the right fit for their company, and then offer them a job contingent upon graduation. But for these programs, those foreign nationals are mainly going to be F1 students, meaning they're you know, in their junior year of a bachelor's program or second year in a three-year master's program. So, you know, one more year till graduation. So they're in an F1 status and they're given a CPT work authorization to perform summer internship work. Or they might be a J1, meaning they are an international student. So meaning they are a student outside of the U.S. They can leverage the J visa as an intern. So this J1 student must be a student at a university outside the U.S., And they may be in sort of a semester break or a recent grad to qualify for a J-1. You know, but given the timeline and project management aspect of delivering an internship program, 
for an organization. I think the successful intern programs that I've consulted on for my clients or seen them run are ones that are run internally. And so there's often a dedicated HR team or um, shared HR resource. It could be the global mobility person, but not always, that is is supporting the onboarding of these interns because it really runs separate than the full-time hires that this organization may be partnering with council about. And I think that makes sense because for these F1s, the CPT is something that they directly obtain the I-20 from the school. And the J-1, so long as the program is working with a strong J-1 provider, which there are many, the documentation is submitted directly to a J-1 provider. Often it is very straightforward. Often these J-1 providers are very generous with their time and expertise to craft the relevant and necessary documentation they need to properly adjudicate the J-1 approval for that international student to then take to the U.S. consulate abroad to secure the J-1 visa to enter the U.S. So my opinion on these programs is to dedicate a resource and leave counsel out of it. I think maybe not everyone would share this opinion, but that these intern programs actually run very successfully when you have a strong HR team supporting, you know, the onboarding process, ensuring the timeline for the documents for these students and have a strong J1 program partner. I don't think you need to involve counsel and, and hack save fees for the program fun, fun time for these interns. So that's what I think sort of these mid-sized programs that have a very traditional internship program, as long as there's a dedicated resource for the project management and partnership with a J1 provider, I think those programs run very successfully. The second bucket is kind of these non-traditional internships. So these could be like fixed term positions, you know, a limited contract, still an employee, but an employee that is working for three months with the company. This happens a lot with like R&D work um, where they need to bring on, you know, a lab scientist to do very specific things or subject to grants or you know, short-term positions, again, that there's sort of a project the company's working on and they need to bring on additional resources. These can lend themselves to internships, but like very non-traditionally. And in these aspects, when I've worked with clients, I think it's really important that the company have a sponsorship policy and that it, especially if these are like fixed term contracts for very sort of limited time positions, that the company not step in as a sponsor. And again, for an F1, CPT, or OPT, the company does not need to be sponsoring at all these individuals. And again, with a J1 intern, the company does not need to be a sponsor. Again, J1s go through a sponsor program. The company then is the placement. So I'd recommend in these types of situations, again, these more non-traditional short-term roles that what we don't want to do with these types of arrangements is to suggest that the company is implying any longer-term employment relationship. So best to keep counsel out of the picture, best to keep any sort of sponsorship notion or support also out of the picture. These types of workers can secure the paperwork on their own. And then the final bucket is these mega multi-division, multi-programmatic internship programs. You know, these are like the large filers, huge programs. These make sense potentially to have outside counsel to leverage from, from just a sheer volume management. But I do know that, you know, with these mega filers, these mega U.S. immigration programs, there's often a very strong internal structure within the company that can process this in-house. And I think we talked last week about cost containment. I think this is a very good program to bring in-house because your resources for these big programs are very talented, have a lot of knowledge, can easily vet J-1 program sponsors so as to partner closely to get those papers in order timely. And if you think about it as just like project management, you can manage it quite easily, even if even if it's quite big. So I could go either way on the on the mega programs. I do think because these are you know short term internship programs, they're going to be managed much differently than the full time employees that in house counsel may be managing for your company. So it's very easy to handle them differently and to put them on a different docket entirely and manage them through your in house HR resources. 
Welcome, Carrie, to the Business Immigration Benchmark. I'm so excited to have you on because I know you have a very diverse experience supporting corporate immigration clients with mega large programs, large programs. And I think together we can identify a few patterns in this data, the government's 2023 filing data that can give our listeners a sense of what the industry is doing and some core best practices that they can incorporate into their programs. So USCIS recently released a lot of high-level data from 2023 on the U.S. immigration system as a whole. You know, candidly, I think there isn't much in those data dumps that HR or global mobility can, like, take away for their programs. I think a lot of policymakers can take away from their data and and make some interesting policy decisions. But in terms of solving problems or making proactive changes in their program sponsorship policies, I like to look at the DOL data. And so that's what we're going to be analyzing, essentially. We aggregated the DOL 2023 LCA data, which is more robust. And I know, Carrie, we talked yesterday how much you like digging into this data, and that it's more specific to the industry. So we're going to run through those highlights and analysis as sort of a benchmarking exercise. And I don't know of anyone else out there who is currently looking into this data and garnering insights from it in the way that we're about to. But if there is anyone who is listening who has similar takes or different analysis and different conclusions, please reach out. We'd love to collaborate and have you on the podcast in the future. This data set is massive and is by far and away the most comprehensive and robust source of corporate immigration data. So on this episode, Carrie and I are really only going to be scratching the surface. And we'll include the sources of our data in the show notes. So take a look at that if you're interested in digging in. Okay, but with that, let's let's dig in, Carrie. Just under 500 certified LCAs filed for H-1Bs in 2023. So that's about 99% of LCAs that are filed are for H-1Bs and about 880,000 total worker positions filed in LCAs in 2023. So that includes batched LCAs, which Carrie and I are going to dig into a little bit more later. From this, we can extrapolate that the total H-1B filings dropped about 10% from 2022 to 2023 across the market. So in 2022, there was 555,000 LCAs filed. Any initial thoughts, Carrie, about those insights from just top line data? Sure. Thank you, Laura. Um, You know, as you said, it's really interesting to dig into this this, uh, data set, which is published by the Department of Labor on an annual basis, but also on a quarterly basis. And as you said, we're just scratching the surface today. Um, We're talking about LCAs uh, for H-1Bs. There's also PERM green card data, um, which is a whole other podcast. Um, But, you know, I think that the decrease, uh, the 10% decrease is probably due to massive layoffs across industries. Um, And we've seen this even, you know, continue into 2024. So the fact that employers are reducing their workforce most likely means that they're they're not also hiring um, and filing H one B change of employer petitions. Uh, they're probably if they're if they're experiencing layoffs, they're probably in hiring freezes. Um, you know, maybe for particular business units or divisions, um, they are filing change of employers. But we've seen a, a, a huge slowdown with H one B transfers, aka change of employer petitions. Yeah, that's great. And that we saw from the LCA data in 2023 that anywhere between approximately 15 to 20% of these H&B filings were for transfers. And so we do think that, you know, that is down from what we've seen in years past. Yeah, that I mean, it doesn't surprise me. It was probably a higher percentage in past years. We saw a surge in hiring um, during the pandemic, really in 2021. Um, and into 2022. And we think that this decrease is really a correction uh, for that surge. Um, So transfers were not very high this year. The balance and the larger majority uh, of those LCA filings are probably extensions and amendments. And remember that location changes trigger the need to file an H-1B amendment, which triggers the need to file an LCA. Um, And we're still seeing a lot of that with return to office policies and corporate reorganizations post-pandemic. Yeah, there was certainly a lot of that in 2023. I think most companies, if they've decided to return to office, did so in 2023. I'm not hearing much about those return to work initiatives now in 2024. Folks that are still working remote or hybrid are good to go. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the initiatives uh, 
were pushed out in 2023. It's interesting because I think employers are challenged a little bit on the implementation of those initiatives. There's so much inertia with working from home or hybrid models that I think employers are really challenged to get people actually into the office as much as they want to. So we're seeing continued implementation and pushes to to bring people back into the office more often. Good point. And so another interesting insight we've gained from the LCA data is that the top 100 companies account for approximately one third of all H-1B or LCAs filed in 2023. So any any thoughts about just, you know, the market control and these mega filers, what that says about the industry or the market share or who's supporting and sponsoring for national sponsorships? Sure, uh, absolutely. So these jumbo programs <clears throat> are either software services, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, <laughs> software services consulting companies serving internal operations, but primarily external clients um, and, and placing H-1B workers at external clients. Um, so the, the others are large technology companies uh, with an intense need for software developers, computer systems analysts, and other computer-related occupations. So those are the, the primary users. And because of the demand for those type of ocu- occupations, these entities are filing, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of LCAs. Yeah. And within the LCA data, again, this is all publicly available. If you download the DOL data, it might crash your computer, but you can get to it. Um, you know, Amazon in 2023 filed almost 19,000 LCAs, so 18,886. And that's a total market share of Amazon alone filing 3.8% of the LCAs filed in 2023. So when we see that there are fewer LCAs filed. We have all read the headlines of Amazon layoffs. Like it makes sense that these high volume mega programs are really moving the market when we're saying slow down and what Carrie was just sharing. That makes a ton of sense to me. You know, I think the other interesting insight from the LCA data is just understanding these mega programs and how they operate. Like, are they supported by outside counsel? Are these programs producing the immigration work in-house? And and the LCA data gives us a breakdown. But, but Carrie, I'm hoping you can kind of share some insights into the differences between an in-house program like Cognizant or Microsoft that are mega volume filers and and operate all the production in-house versus Google or Tata that leverage outside counsel. Sure. So, you know, these top filers typically have large immigration teams that have been built out over decades. Um, So these in-house teams function as internal, really as like internal immigration firms serving internal clients, you know, business units, departments or regions, um, while also engaging outside law firms. Um, Many of these programs use multiple firms in order to meet the needs of their internal clients. And, um, you know, due to company growth based on acquisitions, these employers inherit the immigration law firms of the companies that they're acquiring. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of different, um, models with in-house immigration teams. Um, and there are really a couple of factors that come into play. I would say the primary factor is probably the bottom line, right? Cost savings, um, from doing the work in-house, um, you know, then you're not paying legal fees if you can do that, that work in-house, um, but you also want to look at the resources. Do you have a team in place um, that can do the in-house filings? Um, and, you know, from a compliance point of view, you know, that team really needs to be managed by an immigration attorney. So, um, you know, these top filers do have um, immigration attorneys, multiple immigration attorneys and large paralegal teams to get this work done. Um, Another factor to consider is technology. Do these in-house teams have custom-built technology that that they build themselves to generate and produce, or are they using an um, out-of-the-box immigration software? I actually know of some sizable in-house programs that just use USCIS.gov and get the forms off the government website and use Flag and actually are not using, you know... um, a software program. At the end of the day, you know, the the 
um, the company is focused on compliance, right? I mean, does doing the work in house um, save money? Uh, can you do it compliantly? Um, and you know, another very important factor actually is employee relations or the employee experience. If you're doing the work in house, um, you know, you you no longer necessarily have a buffer between the company and the law firm. Um, so there is, how are you going to approach your employees that you're sponsoring? Um, how are you going to service them? Some companies use a ticketing system. You know, some have employee, um, employee uh, 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 dedicated uh, um, in-house attorneys that are primarily focused on serving those internal clients. So these are all factors that come into play. And the largest programs certainly have built these things out. Um, I will say that, you know, when there is an acquisition um, and acquiring an immigration law firm, you know, there's an integration experience that happens with that, um, you know, in addition to all of the other integration. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like at these mega jumbo programs that that do the work in house. And again, when we're looking at the LCA data, so we're reporting on the H1Bs that they're filing in house, it seems like they would have a very developed structure. They may have that software and that they're really concerned with compliance and cost savings. And so, what would be your impression for you know, some of our listeners who are HR, global mobility professionals that are looking to advance in their career for someone to? drop into one of these programs or go in-house in one of these programs? What kind of experience do you think they gain when they move into a, a mega program and as an in-house provider? I mean, I think it can only be uh, a, a good thing in a person's career to go in-house at one of these programs because, you know, you develop the skills um, to better understand large immigration program management um, in a comprehensive way, even though you may only be filing LCAs, um, you know, these, these large programs often, often, you know, break down, um, processes very specifically. Um, so, uh, you know, as a paralegal going in, maybe you're just filing LCAs or maybe you're just doing TN support letters or, you know, maybe you're just generating forms. Um, but I, I think that it's a, it's a win-win, um, to go in house at one of these programs because you come out with a better understanding of all those factors that we just spoke about. So if you want to go back to outside counsel to an immigration law firm, your perspective is going to be of such high value um, that you're really going to be able to immediately contribute in a new position in uh, an immigration law firm. Yeah. And I even think from someone who's having experience at these mega filers, then going to a large or medium-sized program will have a really strong command of policy, protocol, and change management that I think some of these large mega filers do very well to very, you know, varying degrees, just given how much movement it takes to sort of turn their large, large ships. That was a bad right. metaphor, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's true. And, you know, it's interesting because policy, you know, you want to have bright line rules, um, but there also needs to be some dynamism, you know, and some flexibility. So I think that these large programs are very discerning on the rules that they implement. Um, and, you know, because they're, they, they're, they should be sort of long-term rules. That's a great point. I do want to shift into, because I know in our prep call, we talked a lot about batch LCAs and just how many of these large filers leverage a batch labor certification application. That's what we mean by LCA. And Carrie, can you provide us some insight into why these mega filers use batch LCAs, why it's a good fit for their programs, and maybe some insight into the smaller programs, how they could be using batch LCAs if they're not already? Yeah, this is an interesting topic um, because these large filers often will do batch dossiers, and there's a few reasons to to do it. Um, you know, last year we were actually doing it in anticipation of the government's shutdown because there was a threat that the Department of Labor's flag system was going to go dark, and so we actually wouldn't be able to file LCAs. So we were filing batch or multi-slot LCAs to ensure that we would be able to continue to file H-1Bs if the government shut down. Um, 
But often, you know, filing uh, a large amount or multi-use um, uh, LCAs, meaning multiple uh, occupations in one LCA, for example, if you're filing a software developer level two in Austin, Texas, um, you could actually file 10 um, and use that same LCA for 10 H-1B petitions. Uh, it's it's really great if you have um, generic job descriptions um, and you have sort of universal um, wage levels and in the same location. Because remember, the LCAs are location, occupation, and wage specific. Um, and it really is a great backstop as well um, if you have sort of a critical mass of a certain occupation. Um, because... If you have a situation where you're trying to onboard, and I think during the pandemic, like in 2021, 2022, when we saw this hiring surge and we saw increased competition to to get people on board it, and people had multiple job offers, uh, companies were using these multi-use LCAs in order to win those employees, in order to provide the shortest runway to onboarding. Um and another thing, Laura, actually that you mentioned was in situations where you have somebody who was terminated and is in their 60-day grace period uh, and coming up on the end of that 60-day grace period, having a multi-use or a batch LCA will allow the employer to file and hopefully file within that 60-day grace period if it's coming up on its end. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, the data point here is that approximately 40%, but upwards of 46% of H-1B filings from 2023 may have included an LCA that was was part of an, a company batching. And so that tells me not only are the mega filers using batch LCAs, but also some other mid to large programs are using it. And so to Carrie's point, you know, there might be some good reason to file some generic LCAs as batch to, you know, keep someone in compliance and filing that H-1B and then amend later. Like there's some ways that you can be really strategic with your counsel and leveraging the batch LCAs. So if it, it might be a good fit for your company to use in the sometimes, not always, because maybe your HR and your position banding isn't as simplistic to afford you batch LCAs like some of these very large programs. Yeah. And just just to sort of tag on to that, um, software developers, the Department of Labor Occupation accounts for 34% of all uh, LCAs filed. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, if an employer is filing majority software developers, it, there's really not, you, you know, it helps sort of control or mitigate risk to have a a batch or multi-use LCAs for software developers. But on the flip side, you have to police and track that LCA. You cannot file 11 H-1Bs on an LCA that only has 10 slots. So uh, just remember that there's some policing that has to go on and some tracking if you're using multi-use LCAs. Yeah, good point. So certainly something more and more companies should be looking into strategically, compliantly, because um, there's a lot to think about there with batching. And that, Carrie, you brought up a really good point with um, some SOC code data where um, in, in 2023, 34% of all LCAs filed were for software developer category. And, and considering the data um, about, you know, SOC codes used, software developers are by far and away the most common code. But any other insights from your practice in combination with the data that you have some thoughts on? Um, uh, well, I mean, I think the, the primary point is that most of the LCAs are filed for computer occupations. Um, you know, I did see that business intelligence analysts and operations research analysts are at the top of that list as well. And, um, you know, in the past, those occupations have actually been targeted for um, um, scrutiny from USCIS, but that's changed, I think, under the current administration. Um, so, you know, we monitor these trends. We monitor, we monitor the the, the scrutiny that we think an SOC code will will garner. Um, and there's also new LCA or SOC codes. For example, data scientist is a, is a relatively new SOC code, and that's one of the top 10, I believe. Um, so yeah, we are paying a lot of attention to SOC codes. Um, 
and also monitoring the new ones that come out. And I think it's worth remembering that every July 1st, prevailing wages change. And so we're also have an eye toward um, the wages on these um, these occupations as well. Yeah, very good point. Okay, I think now let's shift into the industry analysis scenarios. So we've got some anonymized scenarios that we hope reflect some of our listeners' programs to give them some insight into how to think about their program in light of the DOL data that we're sharing and thinking about. So our producer, Finn, here will come on to tee up the scenarios for us. Cool. First one. As a cost containment measure, a VP of Immigration and Mobility is exploring hybrid filing uh, for their company's program. Uh, Here's the info that we have on them and their company, just a couple of the fast facts. Uh, It's a financial firm. This VP of Immigration and Mobility has 20 plus years of experience. Uh, Their team size is 12 members globally, uh, including two new hires who are a former attorney and paralegal duo from, from the company's partner law firm. Uh, their partner law firm is one of the largest immigration law firms in the U.S. They have about 4,000 foreign national employees. Uh, in 2024, they listed their main pain points as cost containment, uh, dealing with sort of the uh, the aftermath of rifts and lack of a strong case management technology system. The question for you on this scenario for you both is how would you advise this VP of Immigration and Mobility on the steps they should take to pilot an in-house filing operation to shift their company towards a hybrid program. I'm, I'm happy to take a crack at that one. Go for it. So I think going back to the the primary factors that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in if, if you're using outside counsel 100%, you really want to look at... Um, at formulating your approach to having an in-house team and, you know, looking at the, your bottom line, um, you know, looking at past spend on H-1Bs, teasing out the legal fees compared to the filing fees and looking at what your savings would be. Um, and then also looking at your bandwidth. Do you have the current in-house team with the subject matter expertise to take a piece of the work in-house? Um, For example, do you have H-1B subject matter experts? Do you have paralegals that have filed LCAs or know how to file LCAs? Um, Do you have several immigration attorneys on your in-house team? Um, Because those immigration attorneys will need to um, advise on compliance, record keeping, anything that outside counsel is doing, those immigration attorneys will absorb and track. And then in addition to that, I think the employee experience. How is this going to change the employee experience? Are you going to have the same type of engagement with employees um, and their managers, or will this change uh, how you engage them because you're now focused on production? Um, So all of these things should be taken into consideration uh, when making the decision to take the work in-house. I will say that typically um, in-house teams choose to do like one piece at a time, H-1B filing at house is relatively low hanging fruit because the opportunity cost is relatively low compared to like doing a perm application. Um, A perm application can take one year plus with current Department of Labor delays Um, and tracking and monitoring those compliance steps in connection with that perm case is a much more heavy lift than preparing and producing and filing an H-1B which can sometimes be done, you know, within two weeks if you're using a multi-slaughter batched um, LCA, sometimes even quicker. So those are the things that I think uh, in-house teams take into consideration um, to be successful in taking work in-house. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And, and Carrie kind of talked about when you're considering building out that internal team, you know, one piece at a time is important and that we see these mega programs will often be taking their H-1B in-house first, but often not taking the perm. In fact, I consulted with a client who had taken everything in-house and the perm suffered, like nothing got off the ground because it is just really difficult to manage those two pieces where h one is very high paced, fast paced, need to get those resources in the door as quickly as possible. And so it's very easy to put perm on the back burner, especially if you're a team that's trying to do it all. And a lot of 
law firms, you know, WR included, we, we will separate these resources out to ensure that um, the H-1Bs can still be timely filed while the perm is ongoing. And so that you don't want to be the same team trying to balance the short-term immediate priorities with the long-term priorities because what ends up happening is those long-term priorities end up taking much longer and then the program suffers. So something to consider. All right. Second scenario. A principal immigration specialist is leading a rapidly growing AI company that expects large new hire classes throughout 2024. Uh, Here's the info we have on her and her company. Uh, It's an AI SaaS company. She has about seven years of experience in the industry. Um, No internal team. She's a solo uh, immigration specialist running the entire program. Uh, They do have a partner law firm, but it's a bit of a boutique immigration law firm. And this AI company is their largest client. Uh, they have about 84 national employees, but uh, it's growing by anywhere between five and 10 new hires per month. So rapid growth. Uh, and they listed their 2024 pain points as keeping up with hiring demands, uh, steep competition for AI talent. And as a result of that steep competition, uh, losing H-1B transfers uh, because of delayed or mishandled immigration filings. So the question for for you both is, how would you consult this principal immigration specialist on building her H-1B transfer pipeline to keep up with hiring demands and ensure the company doesn't lose out uh, on other talent going forward? Yeah, I think this is a great situation to use batch or multi-use LCAs if there is a software developer role that um, is consistently being recruited in the same location. Um Having a pre-certified LCA can reduce the time to file, which seems to be critical in this case study, um, by several weeks. Uh, You know, I mean, an H would be could be filed within a matter of days if there is a pre-certified LCA. So I think that's one thing that would be recommended. Yeah, I think that's good. I think this principal immigration specialist probably also needs to think about expanding her team. I mean, that's a ton of work to be solo managing from the in-house perspective. You know, that's a lot of paperwork to sign, a lot of internal engagement like Carrie was was mentioning. So thinking strategically with counsel about what is counsel doing well, what does counsel need to improve on? And, and maybe even thinking about doing a split model here with this explosive growth, this could be a company that could really benefit from maybe tracking you know, H-1B to one firm that can do that well and another for the the IV, the, the green card work. Um, that could be a, an easy way to split it. But this principal immigration specialist really going to need some additional help to help coordinate and just make sure all the pieces are running. Whether they stay with one firm or not, they just need more hands on deck from an internal perspective is, is sort of my first take on that. Yeah, I think I think in that regard, sort of to tag on it, um, you know, you mentioned a solo person running this program. Um, from a compliance point of view, there's, you know, there's some things that can be done to absorb the burden. You know, for example, automated LCA postings, um, automated public access file generation and storage. Um, you know, that will really take a lot of the compliance growth work off of the plate of this single person and with the growth um, of this company, I think that that's really um, sort of low hanging fruit and something that should just be done. Great point. So any um, final thoughts, Carrie, from our, you know, DOL data dump analysis um, scenarios, anything you want to conclude with here? This is really fun. Uh, um, you know, it's 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 nice to go through this data every once in a while um, and get some of this more macro level um, analysis. And I think I would just um, note that this is purely H-1B LCA focused. Um, when it comes to PERM DOL data, it's really a whole different game. And as you mentioned, Laura, uh, in-house teams really approach PERM differently and often will use outside counsel to manage that. Although some some programs do it in house as well, um, but maybe we can have another session um, where we go over perm and some of the other details with uh, LCA data. Yeah, absolutely, Carrie. We're going to have you back on. We're going to dive into the perm data and kind of truck through that with you. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. Good seeing you, Laura. Thank you, Carrie, for joining us on the Business Immigration Benchmark, and thank you all listeners out there for tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Business Immigration Benchmark on Spotify or follow 
WR Immigration on YouTube so you don't miss an episode when we drop them every Monday. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you've got any questions for Carrie and I, please drop us a DM on LinkedIn. That's the best way to shoot us any feedback, questions, comments on this episode or thoughts on what to include in the future. We hope you enjoyed this episode and join us next week here on the Business Immigration Benchmark. See you all next week. 